I am humbled and honored to be involved in this reading and to welcome you all tonight. My role is to give some brief opening remarks and then to introduce the real introducer and vital participant, Julie Carr. So here goes. Poetry is always a dying language, but never a dead language, writes Robert, Robert Smithson. As a group of humans who are working in a dying language, we are attuned to all that is dying. We acknowledge that we are confounded of the dead, the endangered, and the living. We are aware of words that have emerged, words like gunnus, G-O-N-N-E-S, only to become something else, G-U-N. We know that the word gun means from its etymological origin, war, and that to hold a gun means to hold war in one's hands. We know that poetry is older than guns. We know that this continent and its peoples pre-existed horses and guns, that they were brought here by empire, and that the superfluity of guns is perpetuated by involutions of empire and residual recalcitrant concepts of supremacy and by different ideas of defense and constructs of the self and of which selves warrant being defended or the right to self-defense. Hand cannons, they were called when they first came to this continent. Do you have a hand cannon permit? Do you have a hand grenade license? When you hear it put that way, it awakens us to the weapon and the circumference of the wound, as does this line by Denez Smith. Bullet is his whole life. His mother named him, and the bullet was on its way. We know, as Kevin Young writes, that the bullet is on its way not only into the bodies of our loved ones and our fellow citizens, but into our minds and legislations and vocabularies and intimate relations. Kevin Young writes, a finger is a gun, a wallet is a gun. We have heard the word trigger enter even our literary terminology. Think of Richard Hugo's best-selling book, Triggering Town, in which he compares inspiration to a gun. He writes, the transformation that follows the trigger can, in the right hands, become poetry. Whose right hand is that? Whose right mind is that? I can still remember the first line of poetry I was ever taught in school, and you'll know what it is. My life had stood a loaded gun. And being taught that the gun was a metaphor for potential. Wouldn't it be more reasonable to say, as Brenda Hillman recently wrote, that our lives had, quote, stood a secret, little, hiddenly shameful, semi-automatic firearm? She'll read that poem next week, actually, here. A sadness comes to the attention of our matter, and we do not dissuade ourselves from it. From it, we are not exempt. The knowledge of men, women, and children harmed, of lives ended without impunity, of bodies maimed without impunity, otherwise known as American history, otherwise known as the six o'clock news. We are not good at math, writes Mojave American poet not Natalie Diaz. Can you blame us? We've had an American education. We are Americans and we are less than 1% of Americans. We do a better job of dying by police than we do existing. Gun violence, I don't have to tell you this, but I'm gonna do it, uh, has been with us since the outset of our violation of these lands, has accompanied the rise of our current police state and military industrial complex, and has been the fundament of our foreign policy. As Vietnamese poet and human rights activist, whose name I'm going to terribly mispronounce, Vo Van I, does anyone know how to pronounce his name? We'll find out. As he has written of the violence America has wrought upon his country, if I could close up all the hatreds of the world into a single bullet, last bullet in the last gun, so that my breast could receive it, then the lute of a thousand voices would sing. Tonight, we gather together with that lute and that last gun in mind, with the ballot and the bullet, 
in mind. We come together with poets and philosophers who've integrated considerations about guns and violence and personhood and community so consummately and courageously into their practice and their purpose. Here to introduce our subject and tonight's authors is the instrumental organizer of this event, Julie Carr. Julie is the author of 10 books, including 100 Notes on Violence and Someone Shot My Book. Carr grew active in the gun laws debate in 2012-2013 when the University of Colorado, where she teaches, was required by the Supreme Court of Colorado to alter its decades-old weapons ban and allow concealed carry on campus. I would go on to it further, but I think I'll let Julie explain it to you. Please welcome the one and only Julie Carr. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's terrific to be here. And thank you, Christina, so much for, for drawing us all together and for caring as much as you do about poetry and the world. Um, so I thought I would just start us off with a few facts. And um, perhaps you know most of these facts, but I think they bear repeating. 48% uh, of all civilian gun ownership worldwide is in the U.S. The U.S. has 5% of the world population, but 31% of mass shootings. Uh, death by firearms are 25% higher here than in any other high-income country. In 2016, over 38,000 people died by firearms in the U.S., and this includes homicides, suicides, and accidental deaths. Uh, this is a chart um, that shows the uh, deaths by firearms in the US as compared to many other uh, so-called high-income uh, countries. The red is suicide and the blue is homicide. Uh, this chart lets us see visually the difference in mass shootings in the US versus other countries, Philippines, uh, was second only to the U.S., uh, but at 18 uh, as opposed to 90 over a 40-year period. 48% uh, of white men now own guns in the U.S. and 24% of white women. 24% uh, of non-white men own a gun in the U.S. and 16% of non-white women. And this particular uh, data didn't break down other groups other than white people, other than to say non-white. So that's what we have from the Pew. Um, black men are 14 times more likely to die by firearm homicide than are white men. And white men are 2.5 times more likely to die by firearm suicide than are black men. And this study uh, also did not uh, consider firearm deaths for women, children, or other racial groups. Um, so concealed carry laws is a particular darling of the NRA and something to just think about as we think about laws. Um, so all states in the U.S. allow concealed carry permits. Um, uh, there are may issue states and shall issue states. May issue states there are just nine of, and these are states in which um, law enforcement can exercise discretion in terms of handing out permits. But in shall issue states, permits must be granted if qualifications are met. Um, all other states other than those nine are shall issue states. And there are 10 state university systems that now allow concealed carry on campus listed here. Um, and there are 11 states in which you can have a concealed carry weapon without a permit. Um, so, Two other things, I'll just kind of finish this bit with. Um, there was a study done last year, um, published in the American Journal of Public Health, which found that states with shall issue laws had handgun deaths at a rate of 10% 10, 10 higher than states with may issue. Um, so th that is a significant difference. Um, and just to mention House Bill 38, which passed uh, the U.S. House in, on December 6th uh, by a vote of 231 to 198. So this is concealed carry repris, repris, rep, reciprocity bill. 
I knew I'd screw that one up. Um, which uh, would require states to honor the, the concealed carry permits uh, from any other state. So effectively, it, it eliminates any differences between state laws. And it also amends the Gun-Free School Zone Act of 1990 so that permit holders would be able to carry a weapon onto any school in the United States. Um, the, the bill has not come up uh, for vote in the Senate. It's not exactly uh, expected to anytime soon. Nonetheless, House. Um, so, um, I thought uh, we would start there, but these are just facts. And I believe that we need them, but poetry and philosophy offer far more than facts. Uh, if we think of facts as the bones of the body, then we can think of philosophy and history as the marrow, the deep truths within these facts, the deep histories within them. And we could think of poetry as the flesh and blood that can liven those facts and make them move. Um, poetry, because it is song and it is movement, and because it can tell the specific stories that belong to particular people, can energize the factual and draw us to care more deeply for what is true so that we can believe in and commit to the possibilities of transformation. Uh, Wynton Marsalis once said, there's more room in the blues for responding than there is for calling. And he's talking about the structure of call and response in blues song and simply noting that there's more time in the song for the, for the re response than there is for the call. And in that same interview, he also speaks of the undying optimism of the blues. So why optimism? Uh, the blues, uh, in which I include some, not all, poetry, uh, might be considered optimistic simply because it produces beauty out of suffering. But more radically, I think if we think of the world and the suffering world as the call, and the song or poem as the response, then Marsalis is suggesting a way in which the blues is truly generative. Rather than merely offering a direct reflection of suffering or sorrow, the blues and poetry as a form of the blues exceeds the world's call and surpasses suffering by way of invention and by way of the imagination. So I'm incredibly grateful to these um, poets and thinkers for being here to exceed that call and I'll read their bios in order of appearance. Um, Eve Shockley, Evie Shockley, is the author of Semi-Automatic, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the LA Times Book Prize. She has published four other collections of poetry, including The New Black, which won the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and a critical study Renegade Poetics, Black Aesthetics, and Formal Innovation in African American Poetry. Her other honors include the 2015 Stephen Henderson Award for Outstanding Achievement in Poetry and the 2012 Holmes National Poetry Prize. And she's spending this year here as a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, Shockley is a professor of English at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. We hear a loud noise, a gunshot, a scream, she writes. Then it's about a million acts, but we'll all play like it's just one. And these lines um, chill me and galvanize me. Uh, next, we'll have Chad Kautzer, who is an associate professor of philosophy at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He's the author of Radical Philosophy, an Introduction, and co-editor with Eduardo Mendieta of Pragmatism, Nation, and Race, um, Community at the Edge of Empire. Uh, and Chad is a, a, a close friend who um, accompanied me and encouraged me to the State House in Colorado to testify during some very important um, transformative months for gun laws in Colorado. And Denez Smith is a black, queer, pause writer and performer for St. Paul, Minneapolis. Denez is the author of 
Insert Boy from Yes Yes Books, and winner of the, which was winner of the Kate Tufts Discovery Award and the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry, and a finalist for Nash, um, and, I'm sorry, this is written oddly, and, <laughs> and, a and also he is the author of <laughs> Don't Call Us Dead, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and also uh, Don't Call Us Dead just now won the prestigious Forward Prize for 2018, which is awesome. Denez writes, paradise is a world where everything is sanctuary and nothing is a gun. So uh, I will read last. Yes. <laughs> uh, welcome, Evie. <laughs> they got it? Okay. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Julie, for um, putting together such an amazing um, sort of framework for us to read in. Um, thank you, Christina. So happy to be with Chad and Danez. Um, so I don't know what I want to add by way of introduction since the, the subject has been so well introduced, um, except to say um, that um, you know, these poems are going to you know, come through my own filter of um, specific concerns um, and inter interact with um, these issues uh, in, in particular ways, in ways that are important to me. Um, but, it, but overall, my sense of it is that gun violence is related to all the violences. Um, and that when we are working on this problem, we're working on many problems at once. So um, with that, I'm going to begin with a, uh, a very short stanza that I think of in the book, um, Semi-Automatic, uh, as an interlude. Stop, meet with me here, weapons at rest, on this stage of reciprocal dreaming. You imagine you hear my desperate breathing, and I, your eardrum, a small heart beating. Usually, I um, pace myself before going <laughs> into this kind of subject, but this is what we're here for. So um, I'm going to start with the poem that um, Julie actually quoted from. Um, it's one of three in the book called A One-Act Play, and I'm going to read two of them. A One-Act Play. Lights up on three people, unmoving. Not all of them are the same gender. None of them are touching. Each of them is looking at another. The moon is full, the stock market is down, the ball is rolling, all bets are off. We hear a loud noise, a gunshot, a scream, a burst of thunderous applause. It comes from off stage. On stage, all three hear the noise as a signal to act. The moment each begins to act, the lights go down. When they come back up, just seconds later, everything has changed. It has something to do with race, but it's debatable how much. It's something that somebody said, but it's not clear who, if anyone, heard. It's about a million acts, but we'll all play like it was just one. Each person has lines to give. Anyone who knows it can write the script. You all know it, right? Um, and... a one-act play. A man in blue sees the black in man, sees the black boy as man, sees the black man as bear, bears the black bear ill will, makes the black man ill, sees the black man on the make, seizes upon the man's black makeup, makes up what he wills. The black man sees the man in blue, bees the blues in man, demands the blues back off, deems the blues black, does the blues deed, deeds the blues back, lacks what blacks need, needs the true blue, bleeds the true black. Blue and black, is that a fact? Black and blue, redo, redo. Um, one of the themes of this book is um, repetition 
and refrain. And uh, this next poem leans into that. Um, those of you who know your Wordsworth um, will recognize the phrase lyrical ballads, right? Um, and I decided to write an a-lyrical ballad, or how America reminds us of the value of family. He was a boy from Chicago in Mississippi heat, being as bad as a good boy could be, whistling his eyeful of an off-limits she, and her menfolk dragged him out of bed, beat him to death, tied a cotton gin to his body, and sank him in the Tallahatchie River. It was three days before the remains were retrieved and the family grieved. Oh, the black family grieved. She was a lively young woman, a Texas transplant, with a new job helping black college kids thrive, daring one day to assert her right to drive. And for failing to give a signal, a cop slammed her head down, cheered for her epilepsy, and dragged her to a cell where she died in three days. They called it suicide, if that can be conceived. And the family grieved. Oh, the black family grieved. He was a Ghanaian immigrant, two years in New York, a hardworking man, religiously devout, who reached in a pocket to take his ID out. When four officers, suspecting wrongly that he was armed, unloaded their nine millimeter semi-automatic pistols into his body, 41 shots just to be safe, to learn that he wasn't the threat they believed. And the family grieved. Oh, the black family grieved. A fun-loving teen, having car trouble one night, still seeking help when her cell phone died, knocked on a nearby door, but the man inside barely took a look at the black person on his porch before he shot her point blank through the closed screen door. In this way, his unfounded fears were relieved and the family grieved. Oh, the black family grieved. He was a sweet-toothed teen under Florida sun, just sipping iced tea, chatting on the phone, but a local vigilante wouldn't leave him alone. And even after 911 instructed him to leave it for the police to handle, pulled a gun, started a fight, then legally, lethally, stood his ground. And yes, self-defense was how this was perceived. And the family grieved. Oh, the black family grieved. She was a vibrant young woman, hanging in the park, enjoying outdoors, chilling with her crew, making some noise, as good times often do. When an off-duty cop, mad that they refused to get quiet and worried that somebody's phone was a gun, shot from his car into the crowd. And the young woman's death was all he achieved. And the family grieved. Oh, the black family grieved. He was a black kid playing in a Cleveland park not the first or last boy to have a toy gun, just goofing off, not pointing it at anyone. And the rookie cop, responding to a caller, concerned that the kid might have a real weapon, arrived and in 11 seconds flat shot him dead. And the story goes on. The privileged are aggrieved, or their eyes are deceived, and another family is bereaved. Oh, the black family be grieved. <sighs> Thanks. Um, I wanted to read one poem that that looked at um, tr uh, guns in the context of gang violence. Um, this is from an earlier book, The New Black. Um, and I don't know how many of you will remember Stanley Tookie Williams, um, founder of the Crips. Um, uh, he did um, murder some people, and that's not contested. But um, after being sentenced to um, uh, the death, after being given the death sentence, um, spending 
decades in prison, um, actually began to write children's books and advocate for peace um, from, from the prison. And um, I wrote this poem just after his execution. A sonnet for Stanley Tookie Williams. And there's an epigraph by Bob Marley. Won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Because all I ever have, redemption songs. All month, this country has careened towards cold and winter celebrations. What a star announced, a birth, and then a chance to fold a year away, pull a fresh one from a drawer. If not clean, well, unworn. In just a few months arrives the ice-hot day of the dead come back to life. Time then to ask how new and re-beginnings differ. Mary bled for the December miracle, as someone must. Did you imagine sacrifice as you called the crypts to life? Did they come, those young bloods, at the crackling of your voice, like Lazarus to Christ? Vigilant night on the road to San Quentin, candlelight. Um, I'm going to read two more poems. I, yes, I'm still within my, my time. I'll try to be respectful of the time. Um, I was so glad that uh, Christina set up the relation of gun to war. Uh, because in a lot of conversations I see about gun violence, um, or not, maybe not a lot, but some of the conversations talk about that as opposed to war and terrorism and such. And um, I don't understand that distinction. Um, this is a, a poem in a form called a lipogram, which means that I was only allowed to use one vowel, and I chose A. This is called a dark scrawl. War can't amass a brass tack. War's all bad acts and lack, scandal and graft. Watch flags clash and tanks attack camps. Arms crack, rat-a-tat-tat, and ban calm. Cabals plan vast land grabs and trash faraway clans, shacks, pads, plants, halls, and farms. War's fans track maps that warp and adapt as rash hands grasp at lands that attract. Rag-clad lad, lads and gals gnaw small snacks, catch as catch can. War's gray days last and last, and as man slays man and clans fall apart, can wax halfway banal, ask, what adder can mask war's stank past? What fragrant balm allay all qualms and angst war spawns? Alas, sad mama's ball, what wan dawn shall mark war's last gasp? What art, pray, shall patch tracks war ransacks? Mass and spark lads and gals war raw shards and call glad days back. And I'd like to end with a poem um, that's newer than the, the most recent book. Um, what to say? I wrote it uh, this, no, a, a year ago now. And um, it's, uh, it's dedicated to the, the 2,000 two plus um, who were held in the Site Memorial du, du Camp des Mille, um, a detention center and ultimately deportation center uh, in um, the south of France, World War II era, right? Les Mille. There is no poem unless I, we, can find the courage to speak. In the middle of a vacation in the south of France, a chance to visit a World War II detention center arises, dusty and bleak, 
just outside Aix-en-Provence, just past the scent of lavender in an ancient heat. The first thing you see and the last thing you visit is a boxcar. You know what it means. It takes the same toll on the breath, the pulse, as the rusted shackles displayed in another damned museum. There are histories of torture preserved all around us, formally, officially, with placards and institutional funding, casually, quietly, unavoidably, in the quality of a glance, the poverty of an existence, the demographics of a mall, a church, a prison. In a former tile factory, we learn again how anything can be misused, how anyone can be abused. A kiln is not a dormitory until it is. Here, there, slept people who were too Jewish to be German, too German to be French, too despised and feared to be defended, even by those who feared they, we, might soon be despised. If I now say Palestine, have I forgotten Auschwitz? If I say settlements, have I now forgotten camps? If I don't say Palestine, have I forgotten Elmina, Selma, Cape Town, Haiti? Must every place name on earth be a shorthand for violence on a map of grief? Orlando, Charleston, Wounded Knee, Sharpville, Gettysburg, Tiananmen Square, Gaza, Katyn, Plaza de Mayo, Soweto, Dominican Republic, Hiroshima, Srebrenica, Rwanda, Cambodia, Ankara, Adana, Odessa, Nanking, yesterday, and yesterday's yesterday, the planet pushing up sycamores and lavender, rice and plantains, fertilized with lead and blood, with rain from poisonous clouds and the dust that becomes of the dead. Adam, whose name means clay, was not baked in a kiln. Eve's name means life, implies the day that follows. Will tomorrow be a place we can name after something that grows? What is the proper use of a wall? There are so many histories buried in the space and silence around within these words. These lines make a poor but portable museum, a set of sketches, palimpsests, faint and painfully incomplete, that map the territory of the human, with arrows pointing in every direction, some leading from you, some leading to you. There is no poem unless you, we, can find the courage to hear. Thank you. It's ridiculous. I need a moment. <sighs> Thank you, Evie. I'm honored to be here with Julie and Denez. Um, and thanks to Christina and Mary at Woodbury for making this happen and hosting us. Whew, still. 
<clears throat> My presentation tonight is entitled Bullethead or the Birth of a Tactical Gun Culture. In my story, the letter A will be figured by its absence or trace to make a connection to Evie's poem. True, true story. The afternoon was probably hot and sunny that day since some of the boys were at a local swimming hole and March afternoons in Laredo, Texas can get into the 80s if not higher. Laredo sits right on the border in southern Texas. In 1931, it had only one bridge that crossed the Rio Grande into Mexico. There are four now. The bridge was completely destroyed by flooding a year later in 1932, as it had been in 1905, and would be again in 1954. According to US Customs and Border Protection, this area is referred to as the Laredo Sector, and it encompasses 110,000 square miles, 116 counties, and covers Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Harlan's father, Horace, was working as a border patrol agent that day in 1931, probably on duty at the bridge, when his son Harlan came home from school and his mother told him about the Mexican boys that had been hanging around that day. According to court documents, the Carter family car had been stolen three weeks earlier, and Harlan's mother was suspicious of the boys she saw that day. At the time, over 90% of the residents in Laredo were Mexican or Mexican-American. That made it actually the least, one of the least diverse cities in the country, and it still is today. This is not surprising given that 80 years prior it was Mexican territory. Horace Carter was among the first cohort of 450 U.S. Border Patrol agents in 1924 and was transferred to Laredo after a purge of the Mexican-American officers there in 1927. The purge was a result of an inspection by the chief of U.S. Border Patrol, Clifford Perkins. Perkins had distrusted the officers in Laredo. The only Anglo on the police force was the chief himself, he wrote in a report. To solve this problem, he waged what he called a full-scale house cleaning by firing or charging half of the officers, officers at the station with crimes. He then transferred Anglo officers from other towns to fill those positions, which brought the Carter family to Laredo. Harlan had joined the NRA in 1930 when he was just 16. His father, Horace, had instilled in him a love of shooting from a young age and he would go on to win dozens of national uh, marksmanship awards. The 17-year-old was therefore already very familiar with firearms when he picked up a shotgun that March afternoon in 1931 and headed out the door in search of the Mexicans that, that caught his mother's eye. In court documents, Harlan testified that he found the boys returning from a swim and shotgun in hand, ordered them to come with him for questioning. The oldest among them, 15-year-old Ramon Cassiano, was the first to respond, hell no, we will not go to your house. According to 12-year-old 12 12 -year Salvador Pena, who was there at the time, Ramon added, and you can't make us, and he pulled out a knife. Harlan pointed his shotgun at Ramon's chest, which Ramon then brushed aside with a laugh and took a step back. Outraged, Harlan responded, you don't think I'd use it? Before Ramon had a chance to say a word, Harlan shot directly into his chest, killing the 15-year-old boy on the spot. Harlan was indicted, convicted of murder, and sentenced to no less than three years in jail. However, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals overturned the conviction in December of that year. Because the, the presiding judge was said to have not properly instructed the jury on the law of self-defense. The charges were dismissed nearly two years later in January of 1933 because, according to the state's attorney, quote, several of the material witnesses, including that 12-year-old boy, have been discredited having been convicted of infamous crimes. So just as the Mexican-American Border Patrol agents were purged to make room for their Anglo counterparts, so too were these Mexican-American boys criminalized to undermine their credibility in the court of law. Later that year, in 1933, Harlan enrolled at the University of Texas under a slightly different name. 
The second A in Harlan was changed to an O in order to bury his connection to Ramon Cassiano's murder. It was this Harlan Carter who would become the future head of the US Border Patrol, commander of the notorious Operation Wetback, and the most consequential leader of the NRA in its history, serving as its president, and then more importantly, executive vice president. That's where the real power lies. When a New York Times reporter confronted Carter with the truth 50 years later and a few days before Carter was up for re-election as vice president, he emphatically denied it. It was a case of mistaken identity, he said, noting the slight difference in the spelling of Harlan. He publicly conceded the truth a few days later after his election to another four-year term in 1981. At the time, writes Osha Gray Davidson, Carter was to the NRA faithful Moses, George Washington, and John Wayne rolled into one. When Carter retired, the NRA produced a 30-minute film commemorating his leadership and lifelong membership and screened it at a celebratory dinner. In the film, there was a close-up of Carter's original NRA membership card, which he received when he was 16. The name on the card read Harlan with an O, but you could see a trace of the original A underneath it. Interlude, Cincinnati, 1977. The NRA we face today was born in 1977. Yes, former Union Army officers chartered an organization in New York State in 1871 to promote marksmanship, and they expanded to promote shooting clubs and competitions in the interests of hunters over the next century. But it was the Confederate spirit and the logic of the border that animated the NRA after 1977. At their Cincinnati convention that year, the executive board proposed to sell the NRA headquarters in DC and move to Colorado Springs, reversing course on some of the recent lobbying and returning to the NRA core concerns of shooting sports and marksmanship. This sparked a rebellion by a hardline faction led by Harlan Carter, by then nicknamed Bullethead. And the rebellion turned into a coup. The board was removed. The plans to move the headquarters were scrapped, and Carter was elected executive vice president. In his victory speech, Carter declared, beginning in this place and at this hour, this period in NRA history is finished. That year, Carter hired Wayne LaPierre as a lobbyist and Robert uh, Dowlett as a lawyer. Dowlett would become the NRA's general counsel and was instrumental in promoting an individualist interpretation of the Second Amendment that was eventually accepted by the Supreme Court. As it happens, Dowlett was also a convicted murderer that was also not uh, revealed until 2014. He murdered a woman in her 30s with a handgun in 1963. This new post-1977 NRA took on an absolute position on, uh, took an absolutist position on gun regulation and promoted a radically individualist interpretation of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, which had never been controversial, much less political, became the rallying cry of an authoritarian movement that deputized white men as sovereign subjects authorized to patrol various kinds of borders and enforce the laws of their own making. Theoretical reflections, lawlessness, and self-defense of subjectivity. And here I'm just gonna introduce kind of two reflections on the story. Um, I can't flesh them out, they're just to um, add to our conversation tonight. Much has justifiably been made of W.E.B. Du Bois's insight about working class disunion the theory, of the, laboring class, uh, the theory of laboring class unity, uh, Du Bois wrote, rests upon the assumption that laborers, despite internal jealousies, will unite because of their opposition to exploitation by the capitalists. Du Bois's explanation for the historical record of failure of this theory, which it obviously is a failure, was that white workers, although receiving a low wage, were, quote, compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage, end quote. Although attention is often paid to the psychological or subjective dimension of this insight, namely the sense of superiority that an ideology of white supremacy supplied in lieu of economic justice, 
It is the public or objective wage, however, that interests me here. To explain this public dimension, Du Bois described how, quote, police were drawn from their ranks, the ranks of white people, and the courts, dependent on their votes, treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness, end quote. Such leniency became the norm and thus a characteristic of white identity itself. It was a form of authorization synonymous with whiteness. And it meant that whiteness became an identity of both law enforcement and lawlessness. It could be seen as an instantiation of sovereignty understood as the capacity to decide the exception. Walter Benjamin made a similar point about the police under whose authority the separation of lawmaking and law-preserving violence is suspended. Du Bois stated this even more succinctly. White men become a law unto themselves. That is to say, in addition to being authorized to make and enforce the law as police officer, border patrol agent, or simply a good white guy with a gun, the privileges of whiteness also include being relatively exempt from it in contradistinction to other groups. Indeed, the condition of otherness in this case is to be subject to unpredictable violence of white sovereignty. This vulnerability, like violence, is a mechanism of racial formation. And I'm not even discussing uh, gender formation in this presentation, but um, many parallel observations could be made. We find these mechanisms at work in the story of Harlan Carter a 17-year-old who, who already assumed he was authorized to take others into his custody at gunpoint, who would commit murder because the law, that law enforcement authority was met with ridicule and resistance by Ra, uh, Ramon Cassiano. A judicial system that showed leniency and thus also reproduced the structural vulnerability of Cassiano, and the criminalization of the Mexican-American border agents and the witnesses to Harlan Carter's crime. This revoked their authority to enforce the law or undermined their epistemic authority to determine what is and is not lawful. This is not a new phenomenon, of course. The second treaties of government so influential in American thought uh, by John Locke authorized colonists in a state of nature to act as agents of law enforcement who could punish, dispossess, enslave, or even kill indigenous others thought to violate natural law. And the US never conformed to Max Weber's idea of the state having a monopoly on violence. Settler colonialism and slavery devolved the power of sovereignty to white property owners for centuries. In practice and from its inception, popular sovereignty has meant the state's production of spaces of rule for one group to dominate another directly through coercion and extra-legal violence, or indirectly through dependencies produced by property right. My point then is not that this is new, but rather that we should locate the NRA and the social movement it is leading within this tradition. It is a reactionary movement, attempting and succeeding at transforming cultural norms, institutional practices, and the legal order itself in order to reproduce the conditions in which this pernicious form of social identity can flourish. An individualist interpretation of the Second Amendment has been central to this effort because it formally grants some sovereign powers to the individual, deputizing them as an agent of violence wherever they find themselves. In many states, this has achieved even greater formalization in the Stand Your Ground doctrines. This brings me to my second and final theoretical reflection, which concerns the absolutist and authoritarian notion of freedom at the center of this sovereign subject, this good guy with a gun. Judith Butler insightfully analyzes this subject in terms of injurability. The mark of sovereignty is to be the one not impinged upon by others, the one who denies their own constitutive injurability by re relocating the capacity to be violated elsewhere. Another hallmark of this sovereign subject is the disavowal of the social conditions of its own freedom. Freedom is associated with abstract natural right and radical independence. 
If the subject were not completely independent, it would be permeable and vulnerable. Today's sovereign subject is fundamentally self-defensive, perpetually on guard against not just violence and thus uh, injurability, but also any form of dependence whatsoever. Georgie Ansey speaks of the illusory construction of the white subject as a self-contained substance. For this kind of subject, freedom can be purchased only at the price of the freedom or sovereignty of another. But as Butler indicated, this is an impossible condition, which is why it is stuck in a position of permanent vigilance and crisis. Like Harlan Carter's name, our structural vulnerability and mutual dependence can be denied, but it cannot be erased. Thank you. I'm very sad. Um, and I have to read poems that it brought me no pleasure to write. Um, so I have to look at this real quick. Okay, I have to confirm that the black guy on there has indeed no face. Um, I've been staring at it for a little while. Um, I have no words to say. Thank you to everybody who put this together. I'm glad I took a picture of myself before this so I could see the last time I was happy. Um, <laughs> um, it's a, I know, yeah. So uh, it's a very, it's very good to be in this room tonight, right? And to like, sort of like reinforce what you know to like understand the depths of American mania about guns. Um, and yeah, um, so I think I'm gonna do less talking than I usually do, and just mainly do poems. Um, although in doing these poems, um, I'm like calling together things to do for this reading. Um, I became painfully aware of the blind spots within my own work, right? Um, and that a lot of uh, the work that I've done, particularly in regards to gun violence, has been looking at uh, police brutality, thinking about vigilante violence, thinking about sort of the ways of white supremacy um, enacts violence through guns on a black body, primarily black male bodies. And so it has left a lot of blind spots in thinking about indigenous violence or violence against Latinx folks, um, violence against women, um, both as a thing of white supremacy, but also of patriarchy, right? Thinking about, um, you know, a woman is more likely to be killed by a man of her same race than anybody else in the in the world. And so I'm also thinking about the blind spots of that work and want to encourage y'all to look at the work of folks like Natalie Diaz, who's been mentioned tonight, um, Frank Wallen, uh, Frank Wallen, who's another great indigenous rapper and writer, um, Tafisha Edwards, who's a brilliant black woman who is doing a lot of work thinking about black, the, the violence against black women, particularly by black men. Um, and so yeah, so look at all these other folks doing things. All right, poems, cool. Oh, let me time myself because I will go over. Uh, okay, I'm gonna start here. The bullet was a girl. The bullet is his whole life. His mother named him and the bullet was on its way. In another life, the bullet was a girl and his skin was a boy with a sad laugh. They say he asked for it. Must I define they? They are not monsters or hooded or hands black with cross smoke. They teachers, they pay tithes, they like rap, they police, good folks gather around a boy's body to take a picture, share a prayer, oh the horror, oh what a shame, why'd he do that to himself, they really should stop getting themselves killed. <laughs> No, where's the poem? Sorry. It should be there. It is where I put it. Okay. Uh, fall poem. The leaves have done their annual death shimmy. Now the street light with no soft green curtain cuts a silver blade across my bed and my body. I didn't want to start with leaves, even though I love how the trees turn the color of aunts and soul train line to the ground each October. 
No one wants to hear a poem about fall. Much prefer the fallen body, something easy to mourn, body cut out of the light, body lit up with bullets. See how easy it is to bring up bullets. Is it possible to ban guns, even in this poem? I lie in the light, body split by light, room too bright for sleep, thinking of all the leaf-colored bodies, their weekly fall, how their bodies like how their bodies look like mounds of a tree's shed skin, as if a child could jump into them and play for hours. There I go, talking about our dead. And if you don't think they are your dead, then I have run from your hands. They are red, like the tree down the street which looks like a hot air balloon of blood. The leaves dyed fruit punch red, red as a child's red mouth after an afternoon spent on the porch with a bag of flaming hots, watching other kids walk by, waiting for kids who don't pass anymore on the other side of summer, who maybe go to a different school now, or moved across town, or made like a tree, and now sleep in a box made of one. So I recently like rearranged my manuscript and now I don't know where any of the poems are. <laughs> so I'm trying to find one. Okay, that's not it, that's not it. No, it should come before then. I know I didn't cut that poem. Mm. Boom, all right, cool. Uh, say it with your whole black mouth. Say it with your whole black mouth. I am innocent. And if you are not innocent, Say this, I am worthy of forgiveness, of breath after breath. I tell you this, I let blue eyes dress me in guilt, walked around, walked around stores convinced the very skin of my palm was stolen, and what good has that brought me? Days filled flinching, thinking the sirens were reaching for me, and when the sirens were for me, did I not make peace with God? So many white people are alive because we know how to control ourselves. How many times have we died on a whim, wielded like gallows in their sunshy hands? Here, standing in my own body, I say, next time they murder us for the crime of their imaginations, I don't know what I'll do. I did not come to preach of peace, for that is not the hunted's duty. I came here to say what I can't say without my name being added to a list. What my mother fears I will say, what she wishes to say herself. I came here to say. I can't bring myself to write it down. Sometimes I dream of pulling an apology from a pig's collared neck and wake up cracking up. If I dream of setting fire to cul-de-sacs, I wake chained to the bed. I don't like thinking about doing what white folks have about do about I don't like thinking about doing to white folks what white folks done to us. When I do can't say I don't dance. Oh, my people, how long will we reach for God instead of something sharper? Cool. All right. Um, cool. Um, I wrote a chat book a while ago that I'd never read from, um, but I think this is sort of the most intensely I've ever like dove into thinking about gun violence a lot within across the things I made. So I'm gonna read some poems from here. Uh, we will rediscover them together. All right. Um, cool, cool. Um, all right, let's start from here. So it's called Black Movie. Um, so I wrote one poem that was like kind of, oh my God, someone wants to say it. Um, so I wrote one poem that like called Dinosaurs in the Hood, I'll read it towards the end, um, that was successful and I was like, oh, can I do that again? Um, and so I made a whole chat book sort of like reimagining 
um, particular films through a lens of like this like in the hood thing that I borrow from Boys in the Hood and thinking about gun violence and also this is like around so I think like you know this chapbook is being written during sort of the conception of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, Black Lives Matter movement and so it's so which I think is a movement very much defined about the optics of gun violence and how the, that particular narrative plays out in this country and so um, I was sort of obsessed with films that were too expensive to make, so I had poems, um, and I was also thinking obsessively about sort of the actors and the narratives of how black death plays out in this country, particularly through police violence. Okay, cool. Um, Sleeping Beauty in the Hood. In the film, townsfolk name themselves Prince Charming, queue up to wake the Sleeping Beauty. Let's name her Jamal. Let's make her everybody's brother or play cousin. All the princes press a kiss to Jamal's wax-dipped lips. All the princes sing songs and kill dragons, but Jamal won't wake up. You mad? This ain't no kid flick. There's no magic here. The fairies get killed too. The kingdom has no king. All the red in this cartoon is painted in with blood. The apples, the velvet robes, Jamal's cold mouth. Cool. Boys in the Hood 2. Let's not mention the original or cast any boys at all. The whole thing is a series of birthday parties for the child who lives in the picture frame. Every year, we watch his family light candles on a blue cake. Every year, we watch the family watch their house burn to the ground. The movie gets old. The boy never will. Cool. Um, a history of violence in the hood. Could be a documentary or could be somebody's art school thesis, but basically we make a dope ass trailer with a hundred black children smiling into the camera. And the last shot is the wide mouth of a pistol we cut to the sound of a, gu of a gun's hot gray bite. And the preview just keeps repeating over and over. And the preview just keeps repeating over and over. And the preview just keeps repeating over and over. And the preview just keeps repeating over and over. And the preview just keeps repeating over and over. And the preview just keeps repeating over and over and the preview just keeps repeating over and over and the preview just keeps repeating over and 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 by the end I'm sure some folks will want their money back but I'm sure some will just die for it they'll just die that was too long let's see uh, okay, uh, cool. I'm gonna read a couple selections. So I, I like, one thing that I had a really complicated time with while writing this book and many books is sort of, um, I was bumping up against this idea of elegy a lot and um, how to properly do that, right? And I think how to do that with empathy um, and recognizing that it became, it, I realized it was sort of impossible for me to write a truly meaningful elegy for someone who I only knew upon the moment of their death, right? I was responding to a lot of things in the news and so, um, I was trying to, like any elegy, I think for me that has been worth the salt has come from like a deep knowing of the person. Um, and to know somebody only through their catastrophe um, became something that I had to encounter. And so I wrote many poems that were just titled Not an Elegy. Um, that was a way for me to sort of move around and to think about this like sort of communal love um, while acknowledging the distance between these actual subjects that I was writing about. So I'm gonna read a couple of these. Um, Not an Elegy for Trayvon Martin. How long... Does it take a story to become a legend? How long before a legend becomes a god or forgotten? Ask the rain what it was like to be the river. Then ask who it drowned. Not an elegy from Mike Brown. I'm sick of writing this poem, but bring the boy. His new name, his same old body, ordinary black dead thing bring him. And we will mourn until we forget what we are mourning. And isn't that what being black is about? Not the joy of it, but the feeling you get when you're looking at your child. Turn your head, then poof, no more child. That feeling, that's black. 
once a white girl was kidnapped and that's the Trojan War. Later, up the block, Troy got shot and that was Tuesday. Are we not worthy of a city of ash, of a thousand ships launched because we are missed always? Something deserves to be burned, it's never the right thing I demand. A war to bring the dead boy back no matter what his name is this time. I at least demand a song, a head. A song will do for now. Look at what the Lord has made above Missouri, sweet smoke. All right. Not an elegy for my Nisha McBride, but an ode to whoever did her hair and rubbed the last oil into her cold scalp, or a myth of the bullet, the red yoke it hungers to show her, or the tail of his hands, pale and washed in shadow, for, they're finished, for they finish what the car had not. If I must call this her fate, I know the color of God's face. All right. Um, let's do this one, these last two. Um, this one's called Who is in the same series, but it's called Who Has Time for Joy. How do you expect me to dance when every day someone who looks like everyone I love is in, is in a gunfight armed only with skin? Look closely and you'll see a funeral frothing in the corners of my mouth, my mouth hungry for a prayer to make it all a lie reader. What does it feel like to be safe? White. How does it feel to dance when you're not dancing away the ghost? How does joy taste when not followed by will come in the morning? Reader, it's morning again and somewhere. A mother is pulling her hands across her seed's cold shoulders, kissing what's left of his face. Where is her joy? What's she to do with a son who will spoil soon? And what of the boy? What was his last dream? What, um, what, wh who sang to him while his world closed into dust? What cure maker did we just kill? What legend did we deny his legend? I have no room for grief, for it's everywhere now. Listen, listen to my laugh, and if you pay attention, you'll hear his wake. Not an elegy for Brandon Zachary. A boy I was a boy with took his own life right out his own hands. I forgot black boys leave that way too. I have no words to bring him back. I am not magic enough. I've tried, but I'm just flesh, blood yet to spill. People at the funeral wondered what made him do it. People said he saw something. I think that's it. He saw something. What? The world, a road, a river saying his name, trees, a pair of ivory hands, his reflection, his sons. Cool. All right. Uh, all right, well, time for one more poem? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm gonna read some sections from, uh, from this long poem um, that I wrote called Summer Somewhere. Um, the poem tries to imagine a afterlife that is exclusive um, to black men who were either killed by the police or vigilante violence or by like some myriad of ways of like uh, white supremacy. I also consider like gang violence to be a product of white supremacy as well. Um, when you talk about limiting resources for folks, then you get violence. Um, so yeah, so this I'm gonna read a couple sections from there. Um, Poems typically have a lot of questions for their authors even beyond their publication. And so I know that at least one of the sections in this poem is voiced by Trayvon Martin, possibly all of them, I'm not sure, um, but definitely at least one. Okay, so I'll read this. Uh, Summer Somewhere. Somewhere, a sun. Below, boys brown as rye. Play the dozens and ball. Jump in the air and stay there. 
Boys become new moons, gum dark on all sides, beg bruised blue water to fly, at least tide, at least spit back a father or two, I won't get started. History is what it is. It knows what it did, bad dog, bad blood, bad day to be a boy, color of the July well spent. But here, not heaven, not earth, we can't recall our white shirts turned a ruby gown. Here, there's no language for officer or law, no color to call white. If snow fell, it'd fall black. Please, don't call us dead, call us alive someplace better. We say our own names when we pray. We go out for sweets and come back. No need for geography now that we're safe everywhere. Point wherever you please and call it home or church or sweet love. Paradise is a world where everything is a sanctuary and nothing is a gun here. If it grows, it knows its place in history. Yesterday, a poplar told me of old forests heavy with fruit that I'd call uncle, bursting red pulp and set a fire, a harvest of dark wind chimes. And after I fell, it kissed sap into my wounds. Do you know what it's like to live someplace that loves you back? There, I drowned back before once. There, I was a dead fish, the river's prince. There, I knew how to swim, but couldn't. There, men stood by shore and watched me blue. There, my mother cried over me, open casket, but I wasn't there. I was here by my own water, singing a song I learned somewhere south of somewhere worse, but that was when direction mattered now. Every where I am is the center of everything. I must be the Lord of something. What was I before? A boy, a warning, a son, a myth. I whistled. Now I'm the God of whistling. I built my Olympia downstream. And you're not welcome here. Trust, the trip will kill you. We earned this paradise by a death we didn't deserve. And I'm sure that there are other here's, a somewhere for every kind of somebody a heaven of brown girls braiding on golden stoops. But someone prayed, we'd rest in peace. And here we are, in peace, whole, all summer. So I'm going to start by just showing you something. Um, so um, I've been making t-shirts as a way to deal. And uh, there are some out there, and you can have one. They're free. Um, but I would, I would ask that you buy a book. It doesn't have to be mine. <laughs> just buy a book and get a t-shirt. There's only a few. Um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I feel incredibly honored to be here with you three and to have heard that work. Um, I barely need to read, but I will anyway, <laughs> but not for long. Um, yeah, super moving. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'll, I, so I've written this book. It's called Real Life and Installation. And the way I think about it is that it's trying to work between two poles. And one of those poles is 
the weight of history and fact and news. And the other pole would be the lightness and possibility of the imagination. Um, and so the poems that I think of as reaching towards that place of possibility are mostly 14-line poems. So they're like sonnets, but they're not really sonnets. Um, and so some of those, all those 14-line poems, the lines are numbered, but I'm not always going to read the numbers. So we'll start there. A 14-line poem for independent study. One burning lyric stayed sailless. Our techniques so feline, it takes its time. Like a trail of ants across a hall. Nothing's not born. A primate, a psyche, an umbrage, a rag. Say God in the beaten airs, birds will eventually be. But still in that. Sadness lingers, says Charles Blow, after the Martin case has closed. A life you take latches on to you. I was nothing, and I slept, Ivan confesses to Alyosha in Brothers K, a confession I have read three times on three separate nights just before dropping into sleep. I am nothing, but still in that, I've wanted to be loved. The sight of reflection in the act of beholding. A man murders a man who is having sex with the first man's wife. The murderer is exonerated because of the law that allows for killing if one feels oneself to be threatened or assaulted. In what way is a man having sex with a woman threatening or assaulting the other, the woman's husband? In a way that thinks of the woman as an extension of her husband's body. Make love to my wife, says this law, and you are raping me. Gotta get over before we go under. Gotta get under before we go over. Raise our food like the man. Get sexy, sexy people, people. Gray Mirror, July 20th, 2012. On this day, just after the very moment when the movie could have been said to have begun, Ashley, age six, who had been kept up late and taken to the movies for there was no babysitter, was, at the very moment when the movie could have been said to have begun, shot dead. One other one was my student's student, another B's friend. I cried all the way to the JCC until Lucy told me to stop. Breathe for those who cannot breathe, said someone into the airwaves. My mother, in her bed, after the loss of all language, will still whisper, piss, piss, piss. It was so close, the death of 12 in a movie theater. We breathed it in. What? did we breathe out. Ben slowly halves an apple. That could be if I let it a kind of purity, if I let it, if I were to be so afraid. Now sing. Drought in the heartland, death in the multiplex. Rough in the heart, landed death in the multiple. Rough tin, the heat, landed death in them. Doubt in that hot man, heat 
in thee. The corresponding, the correspondence of mourning and hope. Tomorrow, at Infinity Park, ammunitions manufacturer Magpul will be giving away 30 round magazines to the first 1,500 people who show up. All you have to be is 18 to get one. That sort of thing never happens here, says the neighbor of the two dead little boys. Yes, it does. The phrase, semblance shattered. A 14-line poem on Infinity Park 1. We are coping with a huge set of historical data, too. Understand the 5,400 deaths are really 16,003. So many uncountable four in the house of the human body. Five, gauzy curtains, creamy walls. Six, a perfect circle of dead grass where once was a fire. Seven, you leaning back in your chair. Eight, yes, I want to love you, but only just a little. Nine, iris blooming late. 10, we're watching the days, 11, each one, one in which, 12, one kid doesn't die, 13, accept the worlds of worlds that do, 14, faces in dreams, underwater, no thing, this foam. I tried to prepare myself for what would be the worst day of my life, but when it came, I was not prepared, says the father of the one black boy shot in Florida, but his sobs on the radio do nothing to dissuade the 73% of Floridians who stand by, stand your ground, says the senator, given the choice between a raped or beaten victim and a dead thug, I'll take the dead thug any day. True story. Safety net. Yesterday, my historian stopped at my table. After we discussed the new gun rules at school, he stood still with nothing left to say. I was considering a sensation in my chest. I, too, had no further comments on this topic I was hysterical. Allowing a sob would do just what? I was afraid to look at my hands. He is wisest who knows, like Socrates, that his wisdom is worth nothing at all. And now, having no one to receive these missives, I write into the space between atoms, the emptiness of organs lying dormant, all the aborted plans with my permit to carry a concealed weapon stapled to my eyeball. Um, I didn't think I could, but I wrote a poem for the Sandy Hook Massacre. It's called Silence in 20 Pieces. There were 20 five or six-year-olds killed that day. Um, I'm just going to read a few of them of the 20 pieces. I also named it that because I was trying to speak to my 10-year-old about that massacre right after it happened, and she said, don't talk about that. That is only silence. One, the boy handed me my change in the parking lot. It was precisely nine hours after the killing. He saw my face. I hope you have a good rest of your day. No hope for the first part. It was five in the afternoon, cloudy, windy, cold. Four, 20 dead, 20 youngest ones. Is it unspeakable? She gets up out of bed. Five, may the circle be unbroken. By and by, Lord, by and graves prepared, entered, complete. They will show us the faces of the murdered children, but not of their parents. Eight, says the emergency room worker, sometimes you enter into that room and you think, I can't do this again. 
My colleagues around the world, she says, ask me what it is like to treat a gun wound since they've never seen one. I treat them every day, she says, speaking from Denver. Nine, mothers experience themselves as active until lobbyists press. Alan D. Kors, Chris W. Cox, Jim Potter, Chuck Norris, David Keene, Wayne LaPierre, Peter Brownwell, Oliver North, Dana Lash, look them up. 10. And what are we to do with such nouns? Carry or throw or toss them? Let's not talk about that, says Alice of the murdered children. That is only silence. The windows of the school have bars. The policeman idles in his car out front in his grim patience. Up goes the smoke quietly as the dew exhales. We call that sadness. 14, I wasn't going to speak, wasn't going to establish myself here where we still live in a real, real world, but I did. I gave myself over to the devilish task to mourn in my complaint and make a noise. 16, one month after those children are murdered, while others are falling all over the land, gun and ammunition sales soar and keep on soaring, gun dealers say, I've never ha seen such demand. If I had a thousand AR-15s, I could sell them in a week. When I close, they beat on the glass to be let in. The phrase, pervasive love. 17. They were wearing gray, moving slowly. They were opening themselves again. 18. I said the word wound in our little group of five, and the men's eyes went elsewhere, out the window. After that, their eyes did not come back. Out the window, the sky was darkening, the temperature dropping, wind. I said the word wound, and the women looked up. I said, there are two worlds, there really are, and no one disputed me, though perhaps we had different ideas about what or who made up these two worlds. 19, there was a pool. We drained it to reveal the creatures at the bottom. Massive eels slid out of our grip. This is your defect. No one else's, it says. 20. It was not death, not more death I was after, though sometimes I imagine the blade against my wrist as I fall into sleep. I was concerned with the gleam of icicles hanging from the eave, with a smudge of blood on the underside of my girl's chin, with the pair of underpants I found stuck between the bottom of the bed and the mattress. Your jaw screwed into that mattress, your face, your back so hardly ever touched, so much like snow falling in a whirl whirlwind. I was looking for a tighter press of bodies and the sorrowful laughter of those who discern the world shifting away. Uh, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I'm going to read the famous two more poems. Um, and they are uh, poems for healing. So they have to, I think they have to be read. They're short, and they're both 14-liners. Another 14-line poem on healing. They abused the powdery line and collapsed the phantom scaffolding on which we thought we stood. Where will you go now, you in your red dress? Your benign limbs at once blessed and beautiful, naked as a word. You have done nothing wrong and you are not condemned. The b body's erotic intelligence is all that there is and is given. And finally, a 14-line poem 
on resurrection. When will I see you again? At the edge of the window, a crimson streak of sun. I tend my child with daily eyes. Say everything simply, or build me a city of only terms I have to look up to see the way the moon fills so erotically a Lucy. But I didn't find you in June, and I didn't find you in July. Pink stones, shiny stones, American red dust, blood dust rising. Thank you so much. So, so how are we feeling? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, would you feel better if you could just commune casually together and, or would you feel better if you had a moment to do a kind of call and response with the poets and thinkers up here? Thank you, thank you for putting it in those terms. Oh, um, what do you think? What would you, do you, do you feel you have completed your? Um, I'm open to questions if people have them, but if not, fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same, yeah. same boat. Yeah. I think I'm gonna, I think it's maybe more important for us to okay. cool. commune with each other. Cool. There are books outside. Um, there are free t-shirts, uh, courtesy of Julie Carr. Uh, and there are human beings for you to speak with out front. Thank you so much for this evening, for all of you for coming and for this incredible work. And, um, and that's all. Yeah. <laughs>